Hi, my name's Stevie and I like to write songs. Today we're going to begin a new song in the style of prog rock heavy metal. I've been thinking a lot recently about the harmonic tropes that are used in classical music and I'm going to try and apply some of these to our new song. Let's have a go. So why even write a song? I've been struggling with this question for most of my life. I have been writing songs for as long as I can remember. I've recorded five albums for my band Sandstone, check them out here. I've recorded a solo album and I've always been very disappointed with CD sales. Every time I've released an album I thought, this is it. This is the album that will finally get us on the radar. We'll be playing download after we release this album. It never quite materializes and it's left me coming to a conclusion that if I'm going to continue writing songs, then I can't write them with an audience in mind. I can't write them to make other people happy because inevitably other people may not like it. So I have to be my own critic and my own audience. I write songs purely for the pleasure of the process. I really enjoy doing it and continue to do it. And I judge my own success purely on how much I enjoyed the process and how much I enjoy the end result and not based on what other people think about what I'm doing. It reminds me of when I was playing for Tim Ripper Owens and his European tours. Every night we would meet a local support act and these guys were phenomenal musicians and they played in awesome bands, but quite often they were playing for free or it was costing them money to play. And I always marveled at the fact that heavy metal has such a healthy amateur culture. It's full of people who are very enthusiastic about the genre and will play purely for the love of it. And that's what I love about this style of music. Ultimately, you don't know what's going on in other people's heads. So you can't write a song that will resonate with them. You can only do it for yourself. Let's have a look at some of the harmonic ideas that I'm thinking about. The first one, is a challenge from one of my mates, Noel McGuinness, who is an unbelievable guitar player and really into harmony. He challenged me to use a Neapolitan six chord in a song a long time ago. In the absence of any other ideas today, let's try that. So let me see if I can explain a Neapolitan six chord. We'll do, of course, it's heavy metal, so we're gonna do it in minor. We'll do it in minor. A Neapolitan six chord is a flattened two chord. So in this case, it would be this but it's in first inversion. So let's hear how that sounds. And then it's quite often followed by a perfect cadence. So it's got two interesting features in it. One is this chromatic movement here. You know? Kind of like that. Another feature that I like is that it's got a tritone between the Neapolitan VI chord. And of course, tritones, yeah, quite heavy metal. So I'm gonna explore that Neapolitan six cadence and look at the chromatic movement that's on it and look at the tritone that's on it and see if I can make some nice heavy metal features out of that. The other chord sequence that I'm kind of looking at at the minute is I'm still loving this idea. Still loving that chord sequence. I've used it before in some of the previous songs, but yeah. So uh, this time, let's try it in G. I think I would like to modulate it. And then back. So 
But it's quite an interesting chord sequence because all the chords are slightly unrelated to each other. They're all borrowed from different keys and so on. And I think it'll be quite a challenge to try and write some vocal melodies over that. So I'm going to start out with my usual template. I've got my drums loaded up, bass guitar and two rhythm guitars panned left and right as usual. Speaking of templates, I've made some changes to my template this month. Hopefully you didn't miss out the big buzz in April. Plugin Alliance made some fantastic plugins available for free, so I've taken them up in this offer. The first one is the Shadow Hills compressor. I'm using this on the mix bus of my drums as my parallel compression. Before I was using a fab filter compressor, but I feel that the preset that I've managed to build on this has far punchier kick drum and preserves the transients of the drums a lot more. So we've got a more aggressive sound this time around. I really like it. And the other one is Brainworks Master Desk. I have this on my two bus out in Reaper. Before I was using Steven Slate FGX and it really was just providing loudness for me and then I had other plugins doing some other things. So this plugin for me does things that a couple of other plugins used to do for me. On it I've got parallel compression and I've got a limiter. I've got the Mono Maker, which I was using a different plugin for. I've got Stereo Enhancement, which I've never used before, which is pretty cool. And then it also gives me some very nice EQ for EQing the master outs and de-resonating some parts of it. So it's an all-in-one plugin and it's quite simple to use and it's perfect for a songwriter like me who doesn't want to get bogged down in mastering and just wants to get a polished sounding master without too much effort. And the fact that it's all one plugin makes it even easier for me. So we'll see how we get on with these two new plugins in the template today and hopefully it'll become part of my permanent work process. Okay, so I think what I'm going to try with the guitar is just playing the basic arpeggios. I'm just back from seeing Dream Theater in Belfast this week, so um, I've been thinking a lot about John Petrucci, and one of the things I learned from his Rock Discipline video is playing two notes per string. What did he used to do? Something like this. That kind of thing. So we'll try it on this. Sort of seems like the kind of thing that I should probably record twice and pan left and right. Okay, you know me, I can't resist putting strings on it. Let's try and do that. Right, so after a bit of tidying up, here's what I ended up with. I decided to add an upper octave on the strings as well. But let's hear that in the track now.
I already have an idea for how the chorus of this song should go. I pretty much always start with the chorus because if I think I've got a good chorus and I know I've got something to work with and I knew it was going to be this. So I've done it as an intro first, but we're going to copy it across and try and make it into a chorus now as well. And so without the lead guitar, and probably straightforward drumming. Simplify those keyboards as well, I think. There's probably not any need for all that. Okay, let's try some lyrics. So here's what I've recorded. I've recorded a three-part harmony. In my usual style, I've recorded the lead vocals, pan center. Read between the lines, you see the sign. But then I've recorded two doubles doing exactly the same thing. Read between the lines, you see the sign. It adds a very subtle amount of depth and fatness to the vocals that I really like. I've also recorded harmonies and there's no center vocal for these harmonies, they're just left and right. Read between the lines, you see the sign, the grand design. And here's the other one. Read between the lines, you see the sign, the grand design. So, these are just following the chords that we're playing, and all together they sound like this. Read between the lines. You see the sign, the grand design, read between the lines. And they're nice and tight because I've used vocal line on them. So in the track. Read between the lines, you see the sign, the grand design, read between the lines. So that's our chorus. So we have an intro and we have a chorus, but we're in a classical music vibe today. So um, one of the things that I wanted to try out is sometimes in classical music, like operas and stuff like that, you'll hear what's called an overture, which is like a piece of classical music that they play at the start that hints at some of the themes that are coming later in the music. That would be a nice idea to try as a pre-intro before the actual intro that we've written. I was going to try and do it really soft in a sort of film score kind of idea. So I was thinking of maybe using the piano. I'll try something like this. And I'll be able to play the vocal melody over it on maybe strings or something. It's a bit tricky to play with my dodgy piano skills, so I'm going to just step it in. Okay, and let's try and make it sound a wee bit more like a piano by adding in some pedal markings for the sustain pedal. And let's hear that now. Okay, cool. So I think I'll repeat that twice and then I'll copy it across. I think we can start with the piano on its own doing this. Then I want a key change, so I'll select it all. 
I think D minor might be a nice disjointed. I've loaded up some cinematic strings as well, and I think one of the things that might be nice is a sort of staccato basses. You know, that kind of idea. I'll try and put that on. Cool. Let's copy that up to symphonic strings as well. And now, of course, we need to bring them across and have them still play through the key change. So we would go up or down, bring them both up to D first. Oh, nice. Have that twice. Cool. Let's make enough room for that at the start of the song. And we'll pull it all back. I'm looking forward to hearing this crash in. <laughs> All right, that's pretty cool. Very happy with that. So this is obviously leading up to where the actual song itself is going to start. That I think this strongly suggests going into a C minor thing that's very driving and straightforward. Listen. You know, one of the things I was thinking about, I'm a big fan of Genesis as well, and particularly Mike Rutherford. And in Mike and the Mechanics, he used to do a lot of this stuff. think that would be nice in this song. And maybe after a while change it a bit and do something like this. Let's try and get that recorded and see if it works out. I have a feeling I would like to do a heavy version of this riff now on the guitars so that it actually moves somewhere dynamically before it goes back into the chorus. One of the most common questions I get asked by people who don't write songs or are trying to get into writing songs is where do the ideas come from? I suppose the pretentious answer is it doesn't really matter where the ideas come from. It's the skills 
and instincts that you use as a musician to flesh out those ideas and turn them into a song that really matters. Maybe this is a good example of it, and maybe it's a bad example of it, I'm not quite sure. A few nights ago I was watching one of those cop shows where they have the bad guy and he's being interrogated and he's clearly lying to the police in the interrogation room. It got me thinking, what would that feel like to actually stone cold lie to someone's face? You'd be very preoccupied with eye contact. You'd be very preoccupied with body language. You'd be afraid that a tiny bit of sweat or something would give you away. It would be quite a difficult situation. And the more I thought about it, again, the more I started writing lyrics. That's what I always do anytime I find something that's interesting to think about. So the idea that someone was really trying to stone cold lie to someone's face, but tiny gestures and body language was giving them away and they were feeling very, very paranoid that everyone in the room could clearly see they were lying. That's the idea for my song. So, a forsaken beat of innocence. This is my poetic way of trying to say a beat of sweat running down your face betrays a stone-cold face. A tiny ounce of integrity inspires to give me away. A subtle veil of arrogance to keep you in the cold. Now, I've just discovered something there. Um, we've used the word cold twice in the verse, and I don't like that. So I'm going to try and come up with something else. Which line? To keep you on the cold is probably a line that I need to keep. Betrays a stone-cold face. A uh, stone-cold face. An ice-cold mask. Let me see if I can come up with something here. A forsaken beat of innocence on a mask of ice betrayed. Okay, it's a bit more cryptic, which is maybe a better thing, not quite sure. A tiny ounce of integrity conspires to give me away. A subtle veil of arrogance to keep you in the cold. A masquerade of tenacity, a battle for control. So that's the start of it, and we'll go deeper into this idea about lying as the song goes on. But for now, this is verse one. Let's try and get that recorded and see if it flows into the chorus or see if maybe we need more material. Maybe you can't go straight from a verse into the chorus. Maybe we need a bridge. We'll see. Okay, so let's find out if that is going to lead into the chorus. Let's see. Let's pull the chorus across. Totally doesn't work. We're going to need a bridge that segues in between these two sections and makes the chorus flow better. But I think we've done enough for today. I'll have a think about it tonight, and when we come back tomorrow to work on it, hopefully I'll have come up with some kind of bridge that leads between the verse and the chorus. So in the meantime, let's have a listen to what we've done today so far.
I wonder, should it go twice? There's once enough. Alright, cool. We're getting somewhere. It definitely, definitely needs some kind of build up towards the chorus. So let me think about that. And do you know what? I said at the start I was going to use a Neapolitan sixth chord. Haven't used it. <laughs> Maybe I'll think about that. Maybe that's the thing that'll get us from the verse to the chorus. Maybe I'll use the Neapolitan cadence and it'll get me from the key of C minor into the key of F minor so that we get that key change for the chorus. I'll try and come up with something. Anyway, it's been an interesting wee day, and I'm glad you watched it. Thank you so much for your time. If you've got any ideas that you'd like to see me do, please let me know in the comments. Like and subscribe, all that stuff. Help my channel to grow. I'll see you next week. You guys rock!